Okay, good morning, everybody. Wow, I'm overwhelmed. We were hoping to break all the records, and I can tell you, okay, I'm not a poker player, but I think we have full house. We had in our last conference about 25% of what we have here today. My name is Gunther, Gunther Lange. Some of you have been in my class or working already with me. So for those who don't know me, I will try to be the moderate moderator. Difficult. And for everything what goes wrong, it's me to blame. That's the normal blame. I'm really pleased to present, in behalf of our team, this conference. This conference has a format which is unique. We tested it first time in London last year. What is the target? We want to join science, applied sports science, and coaching. Athlete-centered, science-based, coach-driven. So I'm happy to see some scientists back there, some doctors, which are our strong partners in coaching. And I'm definitely very happy to see all of you coaches and welcome here. Now, what is on the menu for today? We have two synergetic pairs. Pair number one, we will activate your brain. I promise you that your brain will work and maybe start smoking this morning for the first unit, which is about brain. We have a world-class expert who did his first testing about brain in 1989. Nine. So he has a vast experience in that field. And I have to admit that we, the coaches, we are concerned about kilometers, maybe mitochondria mass, kilogram, muscle hypertrophy, but really to know what happens in the brain in training and competition, how to make use of it in training, neuronal plasticity, we are not really in that. I'm not talking about the distance coaches who have still some of them to find out that even running has something to do with coordination and motor programs, but I talk about us track and field coaches. So we are pleased to present you a topic, brain, and we are happy with Professor Moisen to have somebody who will link it to the practical. So we will not only talk about how the red gets smarter, he will give you practical advice what to do different in tomorrow training. This is the first part. Then, second part, synergetic with this, we have a coach. Now, I am not really happy to announce you, for those who not yet know, that Rana Reiner didn't make it. But we have, I don't call it the replacement, we have with us somebody, some practical coach who I think is closer and more actual in the sense. You all have noticed the big surprise in this competition was the 100 meter final man. I'm sorry about my American friends, which was won by our colleagues and friends from Indonesia. I will present them to you. They are here, coach, athlete, and his staff and his backup. So we will have brain, and then the coaches will talk with you and answer your questions. This will be your part, where you come in. What about training? How do I do this in training? What did they do in training to win this gold medal about neuronal training? Are you with me? This is the first part. Now, we are late, I know that. Can we put the light in? This, by the way, is Stefano, my colleague, who, without him, I could not run this thing. Over there, we have Tanya. Can you raise your hand, Tanya? And Vicky is the one at the door who tells me what to do, how to let you in and not. So, and in the background, the man who looks so serious is my boss. This is Mr. Harald. You have met him already. Now, Professor Moisen, the biggest problem I had with his CV was I had to cut it once and twice and third time. This man has a CV which is too long. I will make it very simple. He is a top scientist about brain research, maybe one of the best in the world. And he's one of the few who can link it to practical. That's why we bring him here. 
so we can see his credentials. I don't want to go into the details. And I will stop talking and hand over the floor to Professor Moisen. Thank you. Thank you, Günther. That was a bit uh, too much of the good thing uh, for me. Um, I always try to stand behind these things um, because I'm not that tall, so for those that don't see me, um, That's better. <laughs> so what I'll talk about, I'll bring you about the brain and the energy necessi necessity for the brain, because that will help you to see if your brain needs energy or not. I'll also talk about central fatigue, because you can be fatigued also probably because something happens in your brain. I'll bring in some possible supplements that are used for managing the brain but probably won't help that good and also mental fatigue because we now really know that once you get mentally fatigued also your exercise performance will go down and we do some experiments on that and also in function of skill learning exercise is very good for your brain it creates new neurons so your brain gets better and a bit bigger maybe so what's the brain? It's something, it's, it's an organ actually. A brain has millions and millions of uh, cells, a lot of connections. It has cells that talk to each other, that signal to each other through neurochemistry. And it has a lot of kilometers of connection. It's a lot. But the brain also needs fuel. And the brain needs a lot of fuel. Any, any idea? how much grams of sugar your brain will be using in resting state during a day? Anyone? Oh, you're shy. <laughs> 130 grams of glucose per day in resting state. So that's a lot of sugar that your brain needs because your brain only works on sugar. And I'll tell you how it converts it into something you all hate, lactate. But at rest, this is a very high percentage of the available glucose we have in our body. So we need to refuel the brain constantly. And we have glycogen, as we have glycogen in muscles. I don't agree with Gunther. Also, long-distance runners know that something needs to be done. But we know about glycogen in the muscle, but also your brain will store some glycogen. And lactate, the thing you all hate as being coaches, is one of the primary sources of energy for the neurons. And how does that work? Well, you have your blood vessels, glucose gets transported into the astrocytes, which is kind of support tissue for the neurons, and it's converted immediately into lactate, which creates ATP. So the, the brain can reconvert the lactate back to the mitochondria and use it in an aerobic way, but when there's a need for very fast fuel, your brain will use lactate as an energy source. So that's already very interesting because it's used in the neuron. And there was a, uh, a few years ago, a Japanese group were the first to show this also in animal studies because one of my problems is that I cannot pick into the brain of humans. Uh, that would be very unethical. But I quite did some animal stuff where you can really look into the brain and measure neurochemistry. This Japanese group, they had rats running for two hours and looked at glycogen use. And this is uh, blood glucose, this is muscle glycogen, and the liver glycogen. This is um, before the soleus muscle, uh, muscle and the plantaris, this is a slow muscle, and this is a fast one. And as you can see, at the end of those two hours, glycogen in the periphery was exhausted. But they also looked at the brain of the animals. And what did they see? That in several brain uh, regions, the, hippo the hippocampus, the cortex, and so on, there was also a depletion of the glycogen after two hours of exercise, meaning your brain can get need for extra fuel. But after this experiment, 
they did another one where they had them, the rats running and they looked what happens with peripheral glucose and glycogen. And as you can see, this is before, after the two hours of exercise. And this is three, six, or 24 hours later for the lactate concentration and the glycogen in the soleus and the plantaris muscle. So you deplete the glycogen and 24 hours later, you have your supercompensation. <clears throat> we all know that this happens. But does that also happen in the brain? And they show this, because here you see the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, brainstem, all kinds of brain areas, depletion. And what's the difference with muscle? It goes faster in the brain, because here, you're already after six hours, there's a supercompensation of glycogen in the brain. So you don't not only use the energy of your brain, but you also recreate extra energy because your brain needs a lot of energy. We tried to, to look at this also, and we, we uh, had subjects, and we looked at their brain with EEG. We had them cycling for 90 minutes at a high, quite, quite uh, a high intensity, and we looked at brain waves with EEG. And what we saw is like this. And I always say this is the weather forecast for Belgium. It might be that there are some clouds here and there, but the blue color means that in those brain areas, before and after, there was l lesser energy available. So we had those guys, our subjects, cycling until exhaustion, and we saw that it was a reduced beta activity, which is a, a specific brain wave, probably also because the brain blood flow was influenced, but probably also because there was less energy available. So this is what you do when you exercise a lot. You can exhaust also the energy in the brain. So the brain needs energy. This is important for decision making. If you're fatigued in your brain, you might uh, lose some of this. So at fatigue, the brain could be in energy deficit. So it's very good to restore not only your muscle energy, but also your brain energy. So does the brain play a role in fatigue? Of course, it plays a role in fatigue. We've seen these pictures. But also, these, well, not all of them are athletes, but let's say sportsmen also are fatigued after a very 100 meter sprint, a 400 meter sprint. You're fatigued. And is that the same sensation as you have after a marathon? So something must tell you that also the brain gets involved in fatigue. And quite some years ago, there was already a kind of a definition of peripheral fatigue. Because we did physiology this way. We did physiology in the periphery, and we did it without the head. And we know that there are several possible uh, mechanisms for peripheral fatigue, also especially your energy in your muscles, for instance. But there aren't two kinds of fatigue. The body is in integration of the periphery and the brain. So central fatigue has to do with neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are very, very small chemical substances that connect between the neurons. So they give a signal, the neurotransmitter finds a receptor, and the signal goes through. And dopamine is a very interesting one because dopamine has much to do with motivation and motor areas. If in this small area, the substantia nigra, about 95% of the dopamine is exhausted, you start getting the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So that neurotransmitter needs to, and I do this because this is what Parkinson's people have. They shake, they don't have a control over their normal movement anymore. And this area, the ventral tegmental area is also rich in dopamine, and you can call that one the pleasure center of the brain. If you stimulate this area while a rat is running, it will run until it cannot stop anymore. It will run itself to death because it likes that stimulus. Dopamine is also much involved in addiction. All, let's say, stimulatives will influence the dopaminergic system. Noradrenaline, we know from the periphery, is also a very important neurotransmitter for sleep-wake cycle, but also serotonin. 
and you see serotonin is omnipresent. And the central fatigue hypothesis was put for, forward by Eric Nussholm, and he said that you get centrally fatigued when you are getting a disturbance of your serotonin in the brain. So it was actually a very um, simple hypothesis. Eric Nussholm, he, was, uh, he, he died a few years ago. He was a marathon runner himself, a professor in Oxford, and said that you, during prolonged exercise, the increase in brain serotonin activity may cause you a loss of drive and may also give you a physical and mental fatigue. And I still acknowledge what Eric Nussholm did because because of him, we could do a lot of experiments trying to say, well, man, this hypothesis is probably not only about serotonin. So, because the biosynthesis of serotonin is quite simple. And this is simple chemistry. You have an essential amino acid, which is tryptophan. You need to have it, sorry, when you're eating, it's essential. It's converted into 5-hydroxytryptophan, and then immediately decarbolics into serotonin. So there's no rate-limiting step. The more tryptophan you eat, the more serotonin you will form. Maybe creating fatigue, question mark. But how can an amino acid become a very important signal transducer in the brain? And is this only responsible for fatigue? Well, yes and no. It's the interaction between the neurotransmitters that will cause the fatigue. So there have been quite some um, publications on this and quite some studies trying to prove that serotonin is the only neurotransmitter responsible for fatigue. Because if we can counteract this by giving, for instance, branch chain amino acids, we might be able to exercise longer. But during prolonged exercise, tryptophan accumulates and gets into the brain. And tryptophan and the branch chain amino acids, they use the same transporter to go into the brain. So the more you put branch chain amino acids on the plate, you might counteract the fatigue. Well, there have been quite some studies, and I'll show you just some of the possible manipulation of tryptophan, the branch chain amino acids, tyrosine, which is the precursor of dopamine, and some other possibilities. We did quite some pharmacological studies. I won't go into this uh, in this talk, but we tried to manipulate the thermoregulation also of the brain, and we succeeded in that. So uh, this year, the IOC consensus statement on supplements was made, and, and we published on this, and there is actual level of evidence that something might happen for cognition when you have some of the supplements. It will make your brain not smarter, but work better. Branch-chain amino acids were thought to be one of the better things in the world. Um, it will counteract everything, but there are some good studies that show that administration, this is a human study, and this is a, a rat study where they gave or tryptophan or low uh, concentration of branch chain amino acids or high concentration, and they did not see any difference in the time to exhaustion. So this is uh, a study of 94 and 95, so already quite some time ago, it was shown that branch chain amino acids will not really counteract the mental fatigue. So there are no positive results in well-controlled studies. This is also the same thing with uh, a rat study. What about tyrosine? It's the precursor of dopamine. And I already told you that this has to do with motivation and also addiction. So the bi biosynthesis of dopamine is similar. You have tyrosine, an amino acid, is converted in L-DOPA. And L-DOPA, maybe someone knows that, Levodopa is the first drug that was made for Parkinson's disease. Anyone saw the, the film Awakenings with Robert De Niro? You know, when he catches the ball? Well, that was that drug that was developed, and that was a real story of the development of that drug. And it's then converted in a very important neurotransmitter. Here, it's, oh yeah, Belgium, of course. <laughs> 
Uh, there have been some studies using tyrosine, but in this group, there was a, a British group, they gave tyrosine to athletes and the exercise time to exhaustion increased. Whoa, that's good. Without influencing core temperature or skin temperature. So they, they performed better. A few years later, because there was some, uh, some criticism on this study, the same group did the same experiment and found no difference. That was strange. And you know why? Because in this previous study, they used a commercially available uh, tyrosine um, supplement, but it also contained caffeine. So here, they used a pure product and no effect. So always be a bit careful when you read the literature and maybe um, some spectacular results are present. We need very much to analyze everything. So the commercially available product or the pure product can give different results. So tyrosine, most of the studies really show that there was no effect on exercise performance. Um, it might improve stress-induced cognition. There might be a small influence on cognition and maybe also in skill learning. But the only positive re results of the use of tyrosine are from the military. And in very extreme cold or hot situations, there might be something going on. And most of the studies, you cannot read them that good because they're quite hidden in the military uh, files. But some of the studies showed in military situation, very extreme situation, that tyrosine might have an effect. So creatine, brand chain amino acids, and tyrosine, they have little meaningful proof of beneficial effects on the brain. So it's not necessary to do something with that. So which things could we use then? Well, there are some products that have a good level of evidence. And of course, sugar, carbohydrates are the first. I already showed you that the brain needs a lot of sugar, needs a lot of, a lot of energy, and carbohydrates will help to keep your brain cool. Mouth rinsing is one of the better things to do. Uh, you probably already heard about all the mouth rinsing studies. That is, the first group that, this, that did this was uh, from uh, Oscar Jurgen group, and Jimmy Carter now is the head of the science department of the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Well, what did they do? They used trained subjects, had them to do uh, 40 kilometer time trials, and they had to rinse their mouth with a placebo or with carbohydrates, and they didn't swallow it. And what happened? They were faster only by having the carbohydrates in their mouth without swallowing it. And this has been studied several times afterwards, and this is only uh, a few of the studies uh, that were analyzed in a meta-analysis, and as you can see, a mouth rinse will improve your performance as long as the performance is within about 45 minutes. Longer than 45 minutes, you need to swallow the carbohydrates because they, it takes about 45 minutes before they pass the gut and go into the bloodstream. But all the shorter duration exercise, carbohydrate mouth rinse will improve performance. And of course, also caffeine. I needed some caffeine this morning because I came in very late yesterday evening and I really enjoyed waking up with a good coffee. And caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. That's a difficult word, but adenosine is also a neurotransmitter. And it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, meaning it slows you down. But caffeine will go sit on the same receptors and stimulate you and stimulates the brain. And there are several possible mechanisms for caffeine. It increases tremor in some people. It will improve your attention. Um, it reduces symptoms of fatigue, and so on. So caffeine really helps. And what we did, we had a caffeine or sugar mouth rinse, mouth rinse study. And we looked on what happened in the brain. We looked which brain areas are working at that time. Because if you know which brain areas are stimulated by caffeine, then you know which effect it has on specific brain areas. 
So how can we measure it? We did some studies with, um, oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. We did some studies in the MRI, but we also do the EEG. And this is what you typically see when someone has a cap on his head and you register the electricity going on in the brain. Not easy because you need to analyze all the signals and any movement artifact will also cause artifacts here. So we studied this where we had the caffeine and the maltodextrin mouth rinsing and we looked at P300. What's P300? Well, if you get a stimulus, about 300 milliseconds after that, your brain will have specific brainwave activity. And that has to do with attention and reaction. So we looked at the brain and again the weather report in Belgium nowadays because it's getting warmer, meaning the red color means that those brain areas were more active because of this. And those were the orbitofrontal cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The I don't understand the people from anatomy that, that well. They say it's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Well, it's this brain area. And those areas are involved in reward and attention, also your working me memory and thinking and action, executive function, which is very important in track and field because you have to act to a stimulus. So those brain areas will be stimulated when you rinse the mouth with caffeine and maltodextrin. So the brain areas involved in reward, emotion, and motor areas. but probably there are much more mechanisms behind it. But this is only one area that we looked at. So fatigue supplements will not help that much, but let's say that carbohydrates, caffeine, but also water will help because if you dehydrate, your cognition also goes down. If you have about 2% dehydration, we know that your exercise performance will already be worse but also your brain will work much slower. So you have to be sure that your brain gets enough fluid also. So central fatigue exists, but it's very difficult to manipulate the brain. And some of the supplements such as carbohydrates, water and caffeine have proven evidence for this. What about mental fatigue? I'm quite on time. This is always what I do. I put some clocks in to, to give me a, uh, uh, see if I'm on time or not, and I'm, I'm going fast, I think. Am I too fast for the translators? It's okay? Okay. So, you probably will be mentally fatigued after my talk. Because I gave you a lot of new information. Well, what can we do for mental fatigue? It has been shown that you get fatigued, but when you're mentally fatigued, also your exercise performance can go down. So we have a few reviews, so if you want to look into the literature on this, this is a, a systematic review we published last year, and this is uh, a possible explanation we, we just published uh, together with an Australian group, because it has to do with, again, the neurotransmission in the brain. So mental fatigue can have implications for many aspects of daily life. There can be a decreased endurance performance, there have been quite some studies that show when you're mentally fatigued, and I'll explain immediately how we mentally fatigue our, our subjects, um, that your exercise performance goes down. So when your brain is not working that well, also your performance on long distance, for instance, will go down. But also, uh, there have been some studies that show that also in skill sports, for instance, the game called soccer, that also when you're mentally fatigued, your skill performance goes down. So this could also have applications, of course, in track and field. And one of the most common symptoms is in neurological disorders, but also the, the manual dexterity, uh, anticipation, and so on. And I, I know, and we've got some contact with the military, they're very interested in this also. Because a mentally fatigued soldier could make mistakes. So a mentally fatigued athlete could also make mistakes. So we have to beware that this can happen. So how do we do this? Well, again, we measure the brain activity uh, and we do a Stroop test. Anybody knows what a Stroop test is? A Stroop test is a psychological test. It's actually a very, very, 
I won't say the word, but a very uh, amazing uh, test. Because you get a computer screen and you, you read red, but it's written in blue. And you have to react on the color of the ink, not on the word that you're reading. So that means that you have to work on this and then react. And the more fatigued you get, the more mistakes you are doing. And we do this for 90 minutes. So you're sitting in the dark after a screen and you're doing that psychological test for 90 minutes. The control situation is, uh, a, let's say, a documentary of whatever the planet Earth also. It's also a bit boring, I would say. But anyway, that's the control situation because you need the stimuli. So 90 minutes, mentally fatiguing subjects, and we look what happens in the brain. And we did a mouth rinse to see if we could, again, with rinsing the mouth, with caffeine and, and uh, maltodextrin, that's a, a sugar, to see if we could avoid the mental fatigue. So we did 90 minutes. This is the protocol, 90 minutes of this boring thing. And we did some mouth rinsing in between. And we measured the brain and some other things. So this is the way the mentally fatigue is scored. It's on a, a visual analog scale. And as you can see in the placebo situation, they were more mentally fatigued than in the mouth rinse situation. So we could avoid a bit the mental fatigue again with the mouth rinsing. And this is then that P300 uh, and P200. We look at the first block, the, the, the middle and the end of what happens in the brain at 200 milliseconds after a stimulus. And as you can see here, that amplitude, it decreases, meaning this is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex whatever brain area, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. But in that area, you see that there's less activity, so your brain is not working that good anymore, while in the mouth rinse situation, it stayed the same. So we could not only prove that their fatigue was less, but also that the brain was still as active as before with rinsing the mouth, meaning not swallowing it. So there's a direct connection between the, the, the mouth cavity and signaling to the brain. And that's probably because of the, the, the taste uh, areas that we have. By the way, we also did a study, I won't talk about that here, but we also did a, a, a nose spray with caffeine, and it also improve, improves your cognition. But that's a bit dangerous, won't do it. It's uh, very experimental what we did there. So with mouth rinse, attention and recall of tasks stayed the same. The alertness was the same but that decreased in placebo. So one very simple thing to do with your athletes is let them rinse their mouth with caffeine or with sugar, and their brain will work better. When they have to perform longer than 45 minutes, have them have that, that uh, carbohydrate in their mouth, but they can swallow it then because it will 45 minutes later, it will be in their muscles and it will be necessary in their muscles. So it can help your brain to be more active, to rinse the mouth with caffeine and carbohydrates. Here you see some alpha power that was much lower in the mouth rinse situation, meaning that the brain was more, more alert at the end even of that very boring task. So there was better accuracy during the Stroop task and a better arousal because of rinsing of the mouth. So the brain got some signals. So again, mental fatigue exists and can influence endurance and skill performance. So in the last part, and I still am on time, I'm, I'm going a bit fast even, I like this picture actually, because children need to move. Children should never sit still. They have to move. We don't have enough physical education classes anymore for our, for our young children. And my background is from physical education and physiotherapy. I did a neurochemistry PhD, but I was a PA teacher also. So I, I think children should never sit still because it's very good for your brain. Exercise improves your brain health and you get more neurons when you exercise. So neurogenesis exists. So this is an uh, a cartoon of how a neuron is, you know, there's a cell body and it connects to another neuron and it, it gives kisses here by, by uh, exchanging the neurotransmitters. And when you exercise, 
you get more connections. And those connections are very important for memory, for learning and memory. So we have, every day, we have thousands of new cells that are added to the brain, thousands of the million brains that we have. So percent-wise, that's not that much, but I'm sure, I hope, that is, when you go back to your country, that you remember a small thing of what I said. And that small thing, what, what I said, is because there have been a few more connections between the neurons. Because what is memory? Can anyone tell me where your memory resides in the brain? Where is that? Is that here? Is that there? Is it here? Where is memory? Memory is everywhere. Memory is connections between neurons. A memory is going back to your primary school, going into the classroom, get the smell of the room, and there the memory is back. So it's a connection between senses and connection between neurons. Sometimes you cannot remember anything, and then suddenly you have a link with something and it comes back. So your memory is there, and there's one, one very small brain area that is uh, responsible for the genesis, neurogenesis, of memory. And that's the hippocampus. The hippocampus, it's Latin for seahorse, is a, and that's called the hippocampus because it's, you have two sides, the left and the uh, right side of your brain. It's a small area, and if you have a bit of imagination, it looks like a hippocampus, like a seahorse. And this brain area, and especially this upper part, the dendrite gyrus, is where some, let's say, stem cells, some rude sleeping cells, will sprout and connect to other ones. And here, this brain area will grow when you exercise. I didn't include all the, all the details on that because I have too much to say to you all. But there has been quite some studies that children have a bigger hippocampi, those that are doing exercise one hour a day. But also in people 60 years and older, don't say that 60 is old, but let's say uh, more mature uh, individuals. There was a very, Chuck Hillman did a very good study in the US. They had people 60 plus, 70 plus, exercising 45 minutes per day, that is walking, brisk walking or jogging, compared to a stretching control group. And they saw that the volume of the hippocampus was bigger in those that were exercising compared to the stretching group. Meaning, we all lose our memory. And the older you get, the more your memory goes down, your cognition goes, goes, goes away. But you can avoid that by exercising. And of course, the connection between all those neurons will also be important in skill learning and technique learning for, for track and field. Because there, your motor cortex will also be trained. So neurogenesis exists, and not only when you're young. This is only from the 1990s that people start getting good proof of this. And one of the most important um, developing factors, actually the, the uh, I would call it the fertilizer for creating new uh, brain cells is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It's a neurotrophin, it's a growth factor, and it's a neurotransmitter modulation, and it will create plasticity in your brain, meaning more connections, and the more connections you have in your brain, that's the better it, uh, it will work. And in some pathologies, this expression is diminished. And Henrietta van Praag, you see, only in 99 was the first. This is, when you see this, that's about animal stuff then. Um, so she showed that there was a cell proliferation. And here you can see, again, this brain area. And this is a rat brain. And this is a control group. And this is a group that had one day access to a running wheel. Any idea how, how much a rat runs in a running wheel during the night, because they're night animals? Any idea? Up to easily six kilometers. So that's a lot. And those that were killed after one day, sorry for that, you see, 
Yeah. If not, yeah, but with all the animal liberation people around, they always have to be kept. This is approved by the ethical committee. It's, it's approved by the ethical committee. And I tell you, the ethical committee for animal research is much, much harder than what we do with humans. With humans, we can stick needles wherever we want, but for animals, it's a bit difficult. So the, every, these are new cells. So even if the rat is not running, you see that you make new cells, but much more when the rat was exercising. But there was also neurogenesis because quite some of the cells survived four weeks later. Of course, this is not the same rat, because you can only kill a rat once. <laughs> but these, these rats ran for one day, and they had them four weeks waiting, and then they, it was their turn to be sacrificed, let's say. But you see, more of the neurons survived here than in the simple control situation. So exercise creates new neurons, and there's proof, but not, not that long ago that we showed it. And this is a, a more recent study where they had rats uh, a kind of a skill learning task. Not only running, but they also had to find things. And here again, this is when they exercise, new neurons, but they did the skill training. Skill training is easy. You make sure that they need to look for food and then they need to explore things. And you see they have more neurons. This is a, a specific way of, of coloring new neurons. That's quite quite complicated way of doing it. And this is a, a, a shema. I see that my skills are still good that I don't follow this thing here. But uh, this is before, during, and after the exercise. And you see, if, a, if you're sitting like you guys are sitting now, you will always have new neurons that are immature. But afterwards, half of them will disappear. If there's physical exercise, you create more neurons, but also half of them will disappear. With mental training, it stays almost the same, but you might have a few more, while in the combination of, let's say, skill learning and physical activity, the there are more neurons that survive. So it's very important to repeat things when you do skill training, skill training, and combine, and I don't have to uh, tell you this, but combine it with exercise. So animal experiments showed that brain plasticity exists. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is a very important growth factor. But this is impoverishment, we call it, meaning rats in, in a plastic cage. This helps to uh, create new neurons, but this even more, that is enriched environment. And exercise, they have to explore and you have to learn things and remember things. And how do you see if a rat has learned something or not? Well, you use a water maze. And you take a rat and you drop it into the water. It's a near drowning experience. And there are some signs on, 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 the, on the wall of that, of that water bath. And somewhere there's a hidden platform. And of course, the rats want to escape from swimming and tries to find that platform. And you can measure the time it takes to find it, and also the, the path length it, it does in centimeters before it finds it. And you repeat it several times. And then after eight tries, you'll see that rat immediately starts finding the platform, because it remembers where the platform is. And then you take the platform away. And then you uh, register the time they stay here because, well, that, was, that thing was here. Where did it go? So and that's where you do it. And that's what you all have. Going to a car park at the airport. The blue turtle, the green rabbit, where did I put my car? Well, you have those cues necessary, the connection between the neurons necessary for remembering where you put your car. And even then, you sometimes forget. So you write it down. But that is how we train the rats and how we have proof that indeed those new neurons are not only, let's say, neurons that are present, amino acids, proteins, but that they are also functional. So skill learning also has a big importance for the brain. And for this one, for instance, because the animals that need to harvest in, in autumn and winter time, their brains are bigger than those that don't need to do this. 
I like Ice Age, that's why I let this guy come in. But these animals that have to hide their, their, their harvest for winter time, their brains are bigger. But it's only endurance exercise, but al or also strength training. There have been some good studies that show that also strength training improves cognition in humans, especially in the elderly. And that's important, because what, we, what, what do we do with our grandparents, let's say? Well, it's a bit difficult to get to, to take the stairs, to go to the, 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 the bedroom. Ah, oh, we'll put the, the bed downstairs so you don't have to climb the stairs. Don't do that. Because as exercise training for their legs, their strength training for the legs, have them climb the stairs, but also the strength training will influence cognition. There have been some good studies in elderly persons that not only endurance exercise, but also this helps through a different mechanism. And that's also what, what we did together with a Brazilian group. We had eight weeks of training, rats in a running wheel. And how do you do strength training in rats, you think? Any idea? Well, you have one meter sixty platform where you put food. And I have to climb the ladder to get the food. Ethical committee persons approved. And then you put a weight on their tail. And every day you, you increase the weight so that I really have to climb. Afterwards, you check your muscles. They were bigger. And we checked, of course, also the brains. And I won't go into detail, but both groups had in that water maze, they performed better. So their memory was good. And there are, oops, still alive. <laughs> Different mechanism. For aerobic exercise, it goes through the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And with strength training, it's IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, which is a precursor of growth hormone, which goes through the brain and they act uh, they end into sy synapsin and synaptophysin, meaning they create more synapses in the brain. So both strength training and endurance exercise improves cognition and creates new neurons. So neurogenesis is important for skill training. Neurogenesis exists and can be influenced by endurance, but also strength training. So to conclude, okay, it's good. The brain needs energy and it will supercompensate on glycogen. So that's what I showed you in the beginning. It increases neurotransmission. That's what we did years ago. My first experiment had rats running on a, on a, a treadmill and I put needles in the brain to collect the neurotransmitters and we could see that all those neurotransmitters I talked about increase when you exercise. Central and mental fatigue exist. It's difficult to counteract, but some, some nutritional intervention, carbohydrate and caffeine, can postpone brain fatigue. When <clears throat> we manipulate, you have to be careful with thermoregulation because also when you have caffeine, your core temperature will already rise a bit. And it's important for neurogenesis. And Different forms of exercise go through different mechanisms, but it will influence your brain positively. This is actually the group that really does the work while I go everywhere to give a talk. And traditionally, I end with a picture of my garden. Thank you. <laughs>